Welcome to Escapism. Today we're going to make a 19th century bicycle suit. My direct inspiration for this project is this comic from Punch Magazine. My dear Jesse, what on earth is that bicycle suit for? Why to wear, of course. But you haven't got a bicycle. But I have a sewing machine. Oh, <clears throat> uh, too relatable, too relatable. I think what makes me laugh so much about this comic is not just that the joke is sweet and relatable, but there's something so unaffected and magnificent about Jessie's confidence. She doesn't give a sweet damn what anyone thinks and will wear her self-made sportswear because she is amazing. So let's take a little boost of confidence from our girl Jessie and get going on a bicycle suit. When making this outfit, I set myself a little bit of a challenge. What if instead of buying the fabric for the suit, I bought a large men's suit from a thrift store and altered that instead? And I did that. You might recognize some pieces of this suit from my videos on history bounding, or eagle-eyed viewers might even recognize them from my Child's Curses in Wales video. Yeah, I've had this suit for a while. When it came down to it, despite the fact that the suit is much larger than me and therefore shouldn't present a problem in terms of size, it became apparent that the kind of wizardry that would be needed to properly alter a fully tailored men's suit was way too much work. In the strange way that these things work, because of all of the layers and some complicated shapes, it would be easier for me to disassemble the whole thing and cut out the pattern pieces from the flat jacket pieces. I used the black snail bicycle jacket pattern, link in the description. This presented its own challenges, as not all of the jacket pieces I had had the right proportions, so I had to get a bit creative, and ended up doing quite a lot of piecing. Piecing is period, don't forget. When the other sailors heard the news, oh, they fell into a rage. And with all the ship's company, they were willing to engage, saying, we'll tie her hands and feet, me boys, overboard we'll throw her. She'll never see that seaport town called Kennedy When the captain he's heard the news, well he too fell in a rage. And with all the ship's company, he was willing to engage. Saying she'll stay all in sailor's clothes, her collar shall be blue. She'll see that seaport town called Kennedy Island. I thought of about one kajillion ways that you could break down this comic and the concept of a cycling suit in general. All of them would have given me ample room to run away with an idea or two. We could talk about how with a little bit of knowledge of consumer goods prices and average household income, I could pretty easily place Jesse's socioeconomic status. I could talk at length about the bicycle that was both a symbol and facilitator of women's rights, freedom, and social mobility. I could talk at even more length about how that mobility, freedom, and increase of rights was disproportionately gained by white women of means. I could talk about how the bicycle continues to be a symbol of freedom and empowerment for women across the world, like several women in Pakistan who organize women's cycling clubs in the face of harassment, assault, and unbelievable social pressures. Link in the description for some of these truly badass women. I could talk about how the sewing machine and the bicycle are both weirdly similar technologies in that they have a practical purpose, transport and manufacturing, but it can be observed both in this comic and elsewhere in culture that they can also be used exclusively for amusement and diversion, not for any practical use. I could talk about how the cycling suit really effectively embodies the amazing trend of masculinized women's wear at the turn of the century, and how it was legendary. And even best friend Gertrude with her white shirtwaist and amazing jacket are in on that trend. I could talk about how Gertrude is the best friend we all need. A friend who points out all of the weird crap that we're doing, not to judge us or change our behavior, but to give us a litmus test for the rest of the world. She's still going to walk down the street with you in your bicycle suit, no bicycle in sight, and will start a fight if anyone other than she gives you crap about it. We all need a Gertrude. Yet, for some reason, none of these ideas really held water for me this week. 
Don't get me wrong, they're all very important points, and I will link some of the resources in the description if you're interested in reading further on the subject. But, you know, what I want to talk about today is being weird in public. More as a testament to the history of the thing rather than any actual adherence to original method, I used my vintage sewing machine for the whole thing. This model is from the 1920s, but Singer's basic 27 shuttle bobbin model hasn't changed significantly since the 1890s, and the pattern didn't call for anything beyond straight lines. The wool fabric from men's suits is pretty much the same as it has been for more than a hundred years, give or take some manufacturing changes, and parts of the tailoring process remain consistent over that time. Things like pad stitching, hand basting of certain sections like the shoulder pads and the lapels, and the horsehair interlining. So many pieces to cut. For the record, I'm very bad at following pattern instructions. I look at them, try to synthesize them, but if there's anything about them that's unfamiliar or hard, I decide to just try and make it work without learning. I discussed this phenomenon a little in this video about my 17th century Ella enchanted dress, but a suit jacket is different. Like, really different. Tailoring requires the kind of precision and attention to detail that I couldn't really afford to ignore, because it's not my usual sewing style and it's really, really obvious when it doesn't work out. So, with very few exceptions, like the stripe details being added later, I tried my hardest to follow the instructions to the letter. And that was an intense experience. My ADHD brain doesn't like that. But I buckled down. If I didn't understand a thing, I looked it up before blazing through to the next step. And let me tell you, it was worth it. It's not perfect by any means, but this is the nicest, crispest, most beauteous lapel and collar I have ever sewn. Did I have to unpick it twice? Yes. Is it worth it? Also yes. So, about being weird in public. I love being weird in public, and a lot of that for me is manifested in visual cues. My choices generally focus on my clothes, hair, and later, my tattoos. My hair has been blonde, brown, purple, unicorn, and just about every different shade of red. It has been straightened, permed, long, short, and I have rocked the emotional transition fringe and the awkward growing it out bob dozens of times. Quick little disclaimer, not everyone is safe in public to an equal degree. I'm a tattooed white lady with a magnificent resting bitch face. But in general, let's stick to some basic ground rules. Don't harass people and stay safe. But clothes. Clothes is where I excelled at outweirding my own weird. I had a much longer list of these examples, but I think these two anecdotes sort of summarize things nicely. When I was 15, I dressed up in a Halloween costume which consisted of a royal blue flannel wizard's robe, decorated with glitter moons and stars and a burgundy taffeta skirt underneath. A boy in my English class asked me if I was dressed up. It was not a joke. He couldn't tell. The year I turned 30, I wore this dress to work. In case you can't tell, it's very bright pink, and despite being contemporary, it has a bunch of little gores and has this really cute shape that makes me kind of think of medieval gowns. A work friend came up to me and told me she hadn't recognized me at first because, quote, that dress is so much more normal than your regular clothes. The more things change. Before I move on to the trousers and the finishing touches, I want to quickly mention two things. The first is that I will be hosting a live stream Q&A on the 22nd of May. I will be taking questions from today's video and next week's video, as well as on my stories on Instagram. If time permits, I will also answer questions that are asked in the chat. Info about the time of the live streams will be available on the screen now. During that live stream, I will also announce some slight changes to the schedule of the channel and announce a new project that I'm going to need your help with. My Patreon followers got an advanced announcement of this in a private live stream last week. If you want to support me and get first dibs on upcoming projects and plans, check out the link in the description. 
The second thing is that based on how fun and amazing last year's CoCovid event was, check out the playlist of all of the videos from that event in the card above, we're doing it again! CauseTubers from all over the world have been working away at creating an amazing event for you this year, and I'm so excited to be involved. More stuff will be announced as we move forward, but follow the event Instagram page for updates and details. It's going to be fantastic, and I cannot wait. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. The trousers. I didn't use the black snail pattern for the bottoms because the pattern there is a cycling skirt and I wanted a pair of bloomers. So I found a free PDF pattern, link in the description, and I used it as a reference for the proportions and then as a guide for the leg cuffs. I didn't need to print out the whole pattern because 90% of the trousers were already sewn. I didn't need to recut these ones. I just needed to know some measurements and proportions to be able to make them the right size in order to get that really robust bloomer effect. Because I ended up using the trousers of the original suit for the sleeves of the suit, that's how big Lego mutton sleeves are, uh, I needed another pair of trousers. I couldn't find an identical pattern, so I decided to use a dark matching contrast color instead. The pleats in the trousers were a challenge because they were made to include pockets based on someone who had a 44 inch waist, and those pockets were placed accordingly. So if I were to add pleats, the pockets would either be brought closer together or would seem further apart in relation to everything else. And I had to be careful if I wanted to both keep the pockets and get the waist size I was after. To add volume to the bloomers, I added a very large triangular gore to each side of the leg using the same fabric as the peplum facing on the jacket, which I imagined would be more visible on the final garment. Live and learn. Knowing that I was very limited in my fabric content, I didn't add any of the detailing prior to finishing all of the main elements. And then I decided what would bring the two different colored garments together was mixing and matching the fabrics on the applique strips on the front of the jacket and the trousers. This was a bit of a risk. The pattern only had instructions for adding these elements before it was fully assembled. So I basically just had to make that part up as I went along, which led to some interesting hand sewing positions. Poor Agnes. She puts up with a lot from me. By the way, if this isn't how you let your freak flag fly, that's cool. My little sister is a grade A weirdo just like me, but she hit on the high quality tasteful basics in neutral colors will look good for the rest of time thing in her teens. Yeah, she was doing capsule wardrobes before they were a thing. But she doesn't like citrus fruit in her baked goods, so she's still a weirdo. We all have to live our truth. My point is, when history bounding and historical costuming came along, I was already pretty used to people coming up to me and commenting on my clothes, my hair, or etc. I was used to staring, bemused looks in the comments that range wildly from genuine joyful compliment through inscrutable statements of fact to the less kind variety. But something that I love, something I have found is pretty common in people who dress differently in any way, regardless of if it's history bounding or whether it's a really visually distinct subculture, is that there is this immense strength to be gained from dressing against the grain. It's almost like armor. 
It's an embodiment of all the bravery we want to exude, even if some or all of it is a bluff. And fun fact, pretending to be confident is usually a good way of actually gaining confidence, so long as it's coupled with a decent amount of restful self-care and taking a break occasionally. You don't and shouldn't have to be brave all of the time. But walking out of the house wearing this suit, I didn't feel anxious. I didn't feel like I stuck out. I felt powerful. I felt connected to a century of women who looked around and said, at varying volumes, Fuck this. I'm going to ride a bicycle. Hi there! Could I get pie grande size? Could I have that with oat milk, please? Sure. Thank you so much. Blooper goals. Show the children at home how important their helmets are. What are you doing? I am demonstrating the utility of pockets. Sorry, it probably smells like dog. I decided to set a little... So, <laughs> why is this so hard to say? Like, using the same fabric... Thank you, sir. I am trying to make a YouTube video. I can't... It, I can't work under these conditions. I'm a serious artist. <laughs> Yeah, how do I, how do I get out? Help! <laughs> oh no, I'm trapped by my camera. <laughs> All right, I guess I live here now.